Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program, On Offense for Education Freedom, a conversation with Corey DeAngelis. Please welcome Lindsey Burke, Director of the Heritage Foundation Center for Education Policy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to talk about Corey DeAngelis' new book, The Parent Revolution. Very exciting to be able to officially launch it here at Heritage. But let's take a few minutes to think back 100 or so years. 1922 was a low point in American education. That year, Oregon instituted a compulsory attendance law that required all children to attend a public school under penalty of their parents' fine or imprisonment. That law would have outright prohibited children from attending a private school, from getting their education from any source other than the state. Thankfully, this is America, and there was swift pushback. In an amicus brief filed in 1923, Will Guthrie wrote that the law, quote, adopts the favorite device of communistic Russia, the destruction of parental authority, the standardization of education, despite the diverse character, aptitude, inclination, and physical capacity of children, and the monopolization by the state of the training and teaching of the young, end quote. The Oregon law, if upheld, would have created a state monopoly of education, editorialized the New York world at the time. The Supreme Court agreed and held in Pierce v. Society of Sisters that the Oregon law was unconstitutional. It was in Pierce that we get some of the most important and poetic language about parental rights and education. As Pierce held, quote, the fundamental theory upon which all governments in this union repose excludes any general power of the state to standardize its children by forcing them to accept instruction from public teachers only. The child is not the mere creature of the state. Those who nurture him and direct his destiny have the right, coupled with the high duty, to recognize and prepare him for additional obligations." End quote. Parents are a child's first and foremost educators. As COVID demonstrated, in clear relief, however, parents had lost too much of that power. Schools were teaching their children things that were at odds with what parents wanted, with their values. They were hiding things from parents. They even failed and their custodial care duty closing their doors long after we knew it was safe to reopen. In other words, public schools had broken faith with families. But this dereliction of duty led to a parent revolution, as our guest today will tell us about. And it isn't hyperbolic to call it a revolution. In the wake of COVID, 10 states have now implemented universal education choice. Just three years ago, that number was zero. While COVID opened a window for parents to see into their children's public schools, critically, it opened a door for states to adopt school choice. But it wasn't COVID that spent years laying the groundwork for school choice. It wasn't COVID that made the moral and values-based case for choice. It wasn't COVID that worked with policymakers on bill design. And it wasn't COVID that published numerous academic articles on the efficacy of school choice. It was Corey. Corey DeAngelis has been relentless in calling out the damaging impact of teachers' unions living rent-free in Randy Weingarten's head. He has been relentless in pointing out the hypocrisy of the many, many politicians who stand in the way of school choice while exercising it for their own children. Now, many of us, especially here at Heritage, have been working to advance school choice for decades, but Corey has this unparalleled ability to talk about it in a way that gets to the heart of the matter. He leveraged Milton Friedman's charge from 1955 to separate the financing of education from the delivery of services with school vouchers and distilled it down into a rallying cry, fund students, not systems. Corey DeAngelis is a senior fellow at the American Federation for Children and a visiting fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's been labeled the school choice evangelist and called the most effective advocate for school choice since Milton Friedman. He's a regular on Fox News and frequently appears in the Wall Street Journal. He is also the executive director of the Educational Freedom Institute, 
a senior fellow at the Reason Foundation and adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute and a board member of the Liberty Justice Center. He holds a PhD in education policy from the University of Arkansas, and most importantly for our discussion today, he is the author of The Parent Revolution, Rescuing Your Kids from the Radicals Ruining Our Schools. Corey received some great endorsements for his book, and I have no doubt that if Milton Friedman were alive today, he would have also provided an endorsement of Corey's book. So please join me in welcoming Corey DeAngelis. Thank you. You're welcome, Corey. Thanks for being How's here. everybody doing? Thanks for being here. Well, we are so excited to have you. So excited, like I said, to be the official, official launch uh, place for your new book. Uh, it's a great read. If you have a chance, grab it on the way out. I know Corey's going to do some book signings before he heads out. So I mentioned COVID in my opening. Can you talk a little bit? I know this is ground that has been tread and retread over and over again. But let's start there. How did COVID change the relationship between parents and schools? And how did unions respond to what COVID brought? Well, COVID didn't break the government school system. In a lot of ways, it was already broken. And has anybody seen the dedication of the book? I actually dedicated it to Randy Weingarten and the teachers unions for inadvertently doing more to advance the concepts of school choice and homeschooling than anyone could have ever imagined. Uh, she, she should get the, the school choice MVP award for the past three years for stepping in it over and over and over again. And if you want to take Ted Cruz's advice on the back, he says you can ruin Randy Weingarten's day by reading this book. But what I mean by this, look, is they were, they were fear-mongering every step of the way. In DC, I was living here at the time, they were putting fake body bags outside the public school offices in DC to say, oh, if you're trying to open the schools like everybody else, private schools were open, the daycares were open, the private educa uh, educational institutions and other businesses were open, but they said you were trying to kill them if you wanted to open the schools. It was nonstop fear-mongering in places like Chicago, they deleted a tweet, anybody see this one, where they said the push to reopen schools from the Chicago Teachers Union is rooted in racism, sexism, and misogyny. They threw every leftist buzzword at the wall to see what would stick, and they were even vacationing in Puerto Rico, their board member, while railing against going back to work in person. In, uh, in Arizona, they were telling their members to write fake obituaries and epitaphs to Governor Doug Ducey, again, for more fear-mongering. But the good news is, although they did hold children's education hostage to secure multiple multi-billion dollar ransom payments from taxpayers, they extorted about $190 billion in so-called COVID relief because they were able to say, we're closed, and it's not because we don't want to go back to work, it's just, we need more money. That's always the, that's always the answer. It's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. So they've always blamed their failures on test scores based on money. We now spend about $20,000 per student per year in the government school system, according to the National Center for Education Statistics. That number has increased by about 170%, even after adjusting for inflation. So the money's not making its way into the classroom. It's going towards administrative bloat, and people like Randy Weingarten, who make over $500,000 a year, it's not even really making its way to the teachers but parents got to see what the heck was going on in the classroom through remote learning, which, Lindsay, we, let's be real, we should have just called it remotely learning because <laughs> not a lot of learning was going on. That's good. <laughs> but families got to see that the school's curriculum wasn't aligned with their values. Parents who thought their kids were in good public schools based on their rating from the state or based on their kid's report card or the test scores, they started to see that there's another dimension of school quality it's arguably more important, whether that school's curriculum aligns with your values. And Bodie Bauckham said it best, we cannot continue to send our children to Caesar for their education and be surprised when they come home as Romans. Well, the good news is parents aren't surprised anymore. They've woken up. They're never going to unsee what they saw in 2020. They've awakened like a sleeping giant. The kids have a union of their own now. They're called parents and they can beat the unions at their own game if they lock arms, become a new interest group, one for the kids, because they outnumber the employees in the system, and they care about their kids more than anybody else, particularly more than bureaucrats sitting in offices 
hundreds of miles away. So I'm optimistic. If you read The Parent Revolution, you'll see the dark history of the school closures and how they hurt kids academically, mentally, and physically, and socially. But you'll see a lot of a story of hope in that we're racking up Ws all across the country. We have 10 or 11 states going universal on school choice. The GOP has picked up the mantle as the parents' party. We saw with, look, not too far away from here, Terry, I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. McAuliffe lost his election on the issue of education. Republicans were down on the issue of education for decades. Now, according to polling from the Democrats for Education Reform, Republic, Democrats have lost their double-digit advantage on education, and they point to school choice as being one of those reasons, but it also doesn't help when you have the teachers' union-owned uh, Democrat party basically letting the mask slip like Ter Terry McAuliffe did. He had the school closer as his campaign closer. <laughs> yes, he had Randy Weingarten stumping for him the night before the election, and a Virginia mom actually went on CNN, of all places, the next day and said that was the nail in the coffin moment for her. You've closed our schools, and now you're going to close out this campaign? Well, guess what? We're going to vote for the other guy. Glenn Youngkin won on the issue of education, which was the number two issue in that election, by six points with education voters. So uh, you should be excited. Um, one thing I will say is that the school boards association sent a letter to the Biden administration when parents were protesting and wanting to have more of a say in their kids' education. They tried to label parents as domestic terrorists, and they're still today cutting off mics at, at school board meetings in some cases as well. With school choice, parents have more leverage. They might not even have to leave the school because the school will have an incentive to listen to them as opposed to labeling them as evil people, as opposed to bullying them and silencing them into submission. Well, the good news is the NSBA should be renamed as the RSBA, the Regional School Boards <laughs> Association. Why? because 26 states have pulled their funding or their membership from the NSBA. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. So lest you think Corey doesn't keep a good count and doesn't know if it's 10 or 11 states with school choice, it's actually just because we have a friendly internal disagreement. It's inside about baseball the to, the, yeah. to the, full, the fullest. It's Indiana that's 98% universal. It's pretty close. It's pretty close, <laughs> pretty but close. no cigar. No cigar. Yeah. Yep. What do they say? Close only counts in horseshoes and hand right. grenades? Yep. So is it fair then to say that the unions used COVID to empower themselves and conservatives used it to empower parents? Yeah, I mean, there's so much evidence of the unions. There's like a whole chapter on, on what they did. They were lobbying the CDC to make the, the schools closed as long as possible. They knew that if their doors were closed, it wasn't that they could keep their jobs, whereas other private industries couldn't do so. It was also that they knew that they could financially benefit from keeping the schools closed. The incentives are so perverse in the government school system, it's the complete opposite of listening to the customers. It's listening to the unions, and they could leverage the closers to hold children's education hostage to get those ransom payments from taxpayers. One story that's really interesting out of California, so in Sacramento County, they had this stupid health order that said, you have to close if you're a school, but if you're a daycare, ha, COVID's not going to get you. It, it's a really smart virus, you see. If, if you're learning something and you're in the same building, you're toast. COVID's going to get you. But if you're in the same school buildings and you're just sitting there, well, the virus, it, know, it knows. It somehow knows. <laughs> and so there was a private Christian school in Sacramento County that saw that this was BS and so what they did was they rebranded themselves as a daycare. And they retrained all of their employees as, day, as child care workers and said, hey. Um, and it just really, it's a, a story that goes to show you how the incentives are completely backwards in the public school system, which I spend a whole chapter talking about why we should call them government schools. I'm not listening to my own advice. But they're run by the government. They are regulated by the government. They're assigned by the government. They are compelled by the government in a, in a sense, and they're also funded by the government. Yes, I know government doesn't fund anything. It's taxpayer funded, but they're not public in any sense of the word. Um, families have gone to jail for lying about their address to get into better so-called public schools. Um, they've gotten fined for doing so as well. They discriminate on the basis of zip code. It's not like a public park where you can access it. These, these things discriminate on the basis of zip code. Where I live in Texas, if you want to go to another school district across the line, 
you even have to pay tuition to do so. So they're not free either in some cases. And they're not a public good. Any economists in the room, they are rivalrous and excludable. And they do exclude kids uh, based on where they live. And uh, they, they're not accountable to the public. We saw what happened when parents tried to participate in this fairy tale model of democratic accountability at school board meetings. When they don't view you as a customer, guess what? They're gonna view you as a nuisance and try to tell you to sit down and shut up. But what I'm happy about is the parents didn't take that advice. They instead were emboldened to push back even harder. And these victories will continue in the future because the more that the GOP leans into parental rights as a political winner, the more it becomes a form of political suicide for Democrats to oppose it. This is something I call bipartisanship through hyperpartisanship in the book. It's a phrase that I coin, which it's almost counterintuitive to think that a policy that can become bipartisan in the, in the long run, if one of the parties picks up the football and starts to win votes on the issue, and now we're actually seeing what I called in the book playing out before our very eyes in Louisiana. They passed universal school choice through their house easily. 72 to 32, supermajority vote. They didn't need a single Democrat to do it. But guess what? 20% of the Democrats in their house voted for it. Mm -hmm. You look at Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania. He uh, changed his education platform right before the midterms in 2022 to include private school choice. He did that coincidentally just as Doug Mastriano was calling him a hypocrite on school choice. He, Doug was calling out uh, Shapiro and saying, you went to private school, you sent your kids to private school, why shouldn't another family have that opportunity? Right after that, Shapiro changes his education platform and says, hey, I'm not a hypocrite. I do support school choice for kids in failing schools. He even went on Fox News last year reiterating his support. He ultimately caved to the unions and vetoed his own campaign promise. A bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it works out <laughs> for him. But the point that I, that I talked about in the book and in the Wall Street Journal and my article on this is it doesn't really matter whether he had a true change of heart or whether it was just him reading the tea leaves, it's good news for families in the end that you have politicians from both parties who may even be up by double digits in the polls feeling compelled to signal public support for education freedom. As Milton Friedman once famously said, he said a lot of great things and it's hard to keep track of all his great quotes. But one of the great things that he said was that it's the way that you change things is not about getting the right people into office. Obviously that helps that they vote for what you want, but the way that you truly change things in the long run is by creating a climate of political opinion where it becomes politically profitable for the wrong people to do the right thing. And so I, I think we're reaching a, a point of escape velocity for school choice. There's no turning back now. Once parents get school choice, they fight really hard to keep it. And the red states right now are engaging in friendly competition to empower families with education freedom. Hopefully some blue states come along, and if they don't, maybe they'll become red states. Well, so let's talk about that. So as I said in the opening, three years ago, we did not have a single state with a universal choice program, and now we have 10 or 11, however we're counting it. So you discuss in Chapter 4 a shift in strategy. Um, you talk about how um, this is something that uh, we could easily refer to as a red state strategy, and that this is something that um, you adopted, it, worked on, worked in conjunction with your allies. Some might call it a vast... You're one of my allies in that, in that <laughs> yes. uh, tight-knit group. So. Vast right-wing education conspiracy. The vast right-wing education. <laughs> That's right. So can you, can you explain that red state strategy? And then I have a second question you can answer at the same time, which is, or just an um, uh, observation. What you just said, calling out politicians for their hypocrisy. Joe Biden. Nobody in the school choice movement pre-Cory, well, PCE, right, was willing to do that. We were I mean, very polite. And you really changed, I mean, you were willing, you were out there on Twitter. I remember even our, our friend uh, on my team, Jason Bedrick, telling you for a long time, you know, calm down, you know, we don't have to kick every dogging, barking dog, I think you said to Corey. Glad I didn't listen to you, Jason. And listen, <laughs> and you, you kept at it. So can you talk a little bit, because I, mean, I, I do think that's part of how the strategy yeah, you know, shifted. When I got into this as an academic, I thought if I just banged right. the head of policymakers figuratively with the facts, right. they were just gonna be convinced and they were gonna listen to me. If, if, they had, if I had logic on my side, that was gonna be enough. That's not enough, you need to shame them and hit them where it hurts. I mean, politicians care more about poli politics and power than they do about logic or morality. So the, the red state strategy really d d deep dives into that. But I do want to point out the first person I called out was Elizabeth Warren. 
Um, and she, I actually exposed her for lying on video to a voter in Atlanta, a mom that was just saying, I just want to have the same opportunities you had. She had read my tweets on it and also, um, hi, hi Jenny, how's it going? And she also read a New York Post article that I wrote about it and pointing out that she sent her kid to private school. I found it on Ancestry.com. It was really hard to find. Alex is like, you know, 45, 50 years old now, so it's not, you know, it, it was not, uh, not like it was beyond the pale right. to, to expose um, Alex Warren on this. But she went to this voter and said, no, I went to, I sent my kids to public schools. There was a false denial. It was a lie. It added to the Pocahontas narrative that she was lying about everything. And the red state strategy is, to, is the, the idea that I pointed out earlier that the more that the GOP picks up the football, becomes the parents' party, wins votes on the issue, the more that there will be some Democrat defectors on the issue. I talked about Josh Shapiro. J.B. Pritzker sucks in a lot of ways in Illinois. But he did answer a candidate survey right before the election, three weeks before the election, uh, from a news outlet, and he said that he would support the same private school scholarship program for low-income kids that he vowed to eliminate back in 2017. And so you could say he was just looking at the polls. Again, it doesn't matter the reason. And he might not have followed through. He didn't do anything to save it last year, so you can't give him too much credit. But there were sitting legislators in North Carolina and Georgia, Democrats, <laughs> that left the, the Democrat Party to the GOP on the issue of education. Trisha Cotham in North Carolina, and now they have universal school choice because she was that deciding vote. They needed 60% to override a veto in the chamber from their hypocrite governor, Roy Cooper, who actually, get this, he declared a state of emergency over school choice last year. Yeah. Talk about an abuse of emergency powers. But basically, it just goes to show you that he, he was really concerned about his donors, the, the, uh, the, the teachers unions, who, look, 99.7% of Randy Weingarten's campaign contributions in 2022, guess where they went? They went to the Democrats. It's a nonstop, complex money laundering operation that ought to be illegal, and it's why the, the Democrats are basically a wholly owned subsidiary of the teachers union, and this, this includes Joe Biden as well. But the red state strategy is capitalizing on the idea that politicians respond to power as opposed to logic. And for a long time in the school choice movement, we've, made, we've always made good arguments. You can make left-leaning arguments for school choice about it being an equalizer, about you can even say that the public school system has systemic racism in it. If you just look at the left's own definition where there are disparate outcomes based on race and other characteristics. Uh, you can make right-leaning arguments for school choice. Competition's a rising tide that lifts all boats. Personal autonomy, individual liberty. It shouldn't be a partisan issue. It's not among voters. Ac according to the latest Real Clear Opinion Research polling, super majorities of Republican, Democrat, and independent voters nationwide support the concept of school choice. It just happens that the Democrat Party and the elected officials care more about the special interests who control them as opposed to the families. And so we, we were making a lot of these left-leaning arguments, and it wasn't really leading to Democrats voting for it. It wasn't translating to political success. This is something Jay and, Green's pointed out in his, his research. And Jay Green that. at Heritage yeah. Foundation, who was, by the way, my uh, department chair at the <laughs> University of Arkansas. I'm glad you didn't call me doctor earlier, because I'm not a real <laughs> doctor. <laughs> I'm more like a Jill Biden doctor. <laughs> I, I have a PhD right. in education <laughs> policy, but so you I, and can't, me both. <laughs> I can't help you with the important things. Yeah, I'm not a Harvard doctor either, so I don't plagiarize. Um, but <coughs> I think that's what the joke you were trying to make. But, um, uh, I don't even know where I was going. Sorry, I threw me off. Jay Green. Threw yeah, me off. Jay Green. Um, Looking at the votes. So yeah, yeah, so when we were making these left-leaning arguments for school choice, that didn't translate to Democrat votes, and it might have turned off some Republicans. If it's a, it's not a Republican thing. I don't need to vote for it either. And so we weren't getting school choice in blue states in a meaningful way, or even in red states. But if we could lean into the culture war and point out that school choice is not just for low-income kids that are in objectively failing government-run schools, that is a good argument for school choice. Don't get me wrong. That it disproportionately benefits the least advantaged who are stuck in the worst public schools. But COVID revealed that it also benefits families that are more politically mobile who have their kids in good public schools, That, are, according to the the test scores. So families 
exposing the rot and corruption and the ideological divide in the government school system has gotten conservatives riled up and it has gotten uh, a broader coalition of people throughout society to fight for school choice, low income, high income, all different races, all different backgrounds, and all different political persuasions fighting for school choice now, not just certain kids in certain areas, no more picking winners and losers. And that's beneficial for politics because politics is all about organized interests, coalitions pushing for what they want. And the school choice revolution, the parent revolution has unfolded because we've leaned into, into this being a political winner for Republicans in particular. In, in 2022, there wasn't a red wave. Remember people talking about a red wave? Didn't really happen. There obviously wasn't a blue wave, but there was a school choice wave. 76% of the candidates supported by my organization, the American Federation for Children and our state affiliates won their races in 2022. And we didn't just play in the easy ones. We targeted 69 incumbents in state legislatures and took out 40 of them. It's the hardest thing to do in politics. I'm not done yet. Don't clap yet. I, I'm from Texas. I actually live in Texas. I grew up in San Antonio, despite a lawmaker who tried to say, you're not even from here. You have no, no say on what's going on here. Because I used to live in D.C., but I grew up in Texas. I went to government schools in Texas. So if I sign your book later and you can't read anything I write, sorry, I went to government schools. And I can't say it's because I'm a doctor, because I'm not a real doctor. But in Texas, on Super Tuesday, there was a political earthquake that, that rocked the entire state. Because if you don't know, if you don't live in Texas, or if you're not tuned into the debate all that much, the Senate has always been good on school choice. They voted for school choice 18 to 13 last year in a universal fashion. Governor Abbott has been fighting like a hero on the issue, going across the state, campaigning on the issue. He won his election e easily. And then it moved over to the House. And 21 so-called Republicans joined every single Democrat who vote and to vote to kill school choice. Five of them saw the writing on the wall, didn't even run for re-election. Out of the remaining, AFC Victory Fund, my organization, School Choice Super PAC, we targeted 10, uh, we targeted 13 anti-school choice incumbents. And we took out or forced into runoffs 10 of them, translating to a 77% win rate against anti-school choice incumbents for voting against their own party platform issue of school choice and voting to trap kids in failing government schools. So um, that basically never happens. If you're not in, in tune with politics and how things work, incumbents historically have won their reelection 95% of the time. And we basically inverted that trend in Texas. And so we're seeing the red state strategy unfold right before our very eyes. And it's glorious to see because there's nothing they can do about it. The, the momentum is going to continue. It's mostly going to be in red states for now. But hopefully, uh, when more these laboratories of democracy keep working as we intended them to work, we'll see some blue states come along, or maybe the blue states will switch to red states. Or there's also the Educational Choice for Children Act in Congress right now. It has 150 co-sponsors, including Speaker Mike Johnson. And they're all Republicans, but it would supercharge school choice already happening through a tax credit in red states while also expanding school choice to families through the federal tax credit in blue states, too. So I also include in the book different things you can do to the public school system to, to, to make it better for your children. What's really interesting is we have about 40, 50 million kids in the government school system each year. And the left doesn't even have to have kids anymore to shape the direction of this country. As conservatives, we can't win the ideological battle and the cultural battle in America just by uh, outpopulating it. We can't just have more kids and expect our country to move back towards the right. Why? Because the government schools are infiltrated by the teachers unions and the radical left. They, can, they don't have to have any kids of their own and they can still raise other people's children for 13 years of their lives when they're very young and have young impressionable minds for seven hours a day. There's no fighting against that. You think about Hollywood and its impact on culture. I think the school system, even fixing this problem, strikes at the root more than anything else uh, because they're teaching young children uh, to like big government as the solution to all of their problems. We're not going to end this leftward socialist drift in our country just by having more kids. I mean, that could help, obviously. But you need to fight to take back the schools. And in the, the final chapters, I point out 
that there are tweaks to the public school system, including how about simple things, just like don't keep secrets from parents. I mean, I don't know if you've heard about what's happening in California, but a school district that uh, I'm on the board of Liberty Justice Center as well, full disclosure, but we're rep representing a school district called Chino Unified, and they passed a simple policy. It's at the bare minimum. Don't keep secrets from parents. If a child changes their gender at school, you better tell the parent because that's their kids. The kids don't belong to the government. And guess what? The, the, the state attorney general was not happy about that. He really intently wanted to fight to keep sexual secrets about children from their own parents. It's a ridiculous state of affairs that we live in today in some states. Um, but those are some things that you can try to pass. How about transparency? Definitely. How about let's see where the money's going? Nationwide, between 2000 and 2020, the number of students and teachers in the system increased by about the same amount, by about 7 or 8%. But the number of administrators in the system increased by about 90%. The government school system has become more of a jobs program for adults than an education initiative for kids. And if we fund students as opposed to systems, that power dynamic will shift, put the power in the hands of the families, and the schools will actually have an incentive to listen to them. It's been a, a rising tide that lifts all boats in states like Florida. Anybody heard of the nation's report card? It's the national assess assessment that's uh, administered nationwide where you can compare states um, uh, each year. And Florida was doing horribly on the nation's report card for a long time. Fourth of the country. 44th out of 50 years. Yeah. You have the numbers off the top of your head. I don't. But later on, as they've expanded school choice, they've gone to the top of the pack yeah. on the nation's report card, even after adjusting for differences in students across states. And guess what? They spend far less than the national average. It's not a money issue. You throw more money into the government school system, it's a bottomless pit because it has no incentive to spend additional dollars wisely. And I don't blame the teachers in the system. They have, a, they have it pretty rough. I blame the teachers' unions, which are not the same thing, who have no incentive to do the right thing for kids, but they also don't do well for the teachers because they put more money into the system. It doesn't go towards teacher salaries. Between 1970 and 2020, the, the average um, spending in the government-run school system has increased by 170%. I mentioned that earlier in real terms. Teacher salaries have only gone up by about 10% in real terms. So where's the money going? Not towards sure. staffing surges, which means more dues-paying members for the unions, which goes towards people like Randy Weingarten, who makes over $500,000 a year. Um, so it, it, you should be optimistic, though. We, we are winning this war that the left and the unions have waged on our children for far too long. Keep the pedal to the metal. Keep the foot on the gas because we're gonna continue this momentum, we'll continue to win, because parents have become a political juggernaut. They are a political force to be reckoned with. And it's one of the things in society that you should be happy about. So we have about six minutes before we open it up to audience Q&A. So I've got three questions, so rapid fire All right. uh, on the last three. I don't know three. if I can do that. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, getting it back to the state level where school choice rightly belongs, where do you see things going in, say, five to 10 years? Yeah, it's going to be red states first. I mean, we've already done 10 or 11 um, red states on the issue of uh, universal school choice. And I mean, again, we had zero universal school choice states before 2021. So in the past three years, we've had more advancements on education freedom than we had in the preceding three decades. Believable. I mean, it's a huge yeah. amount of, of momentum. And so, look, a lot of people are like, oh, do you think the revolution is going to continue? You're dang right that it is, because parents care about their kids more than anybody else. They know their kids' needs more than anybody else. And they'll never unsee what they saw in 2020. Yes, the schools are open, but they remember what they saw through Zoom school. They remember and they see in front of them today. Look at social media. We basically have cameras in all the schools just by them yeah. just posting their own videos and libs of TikTok showing it with the rest of the world. And that is irritating the heck out of parents because the left sees the school system as a way to control the minds of other people's children. We like to talk about monopoly. Well, yes, one of the issues is that they have a monopoly on your child's funding. We spend about 20000 a year in the government-run schools, but they also have a monopoly on the minds of other people's children. That's why they fight against this reform more than anything else. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, you, we, yes, we, we move the ball forward on, on banning divisive concepts and other yeah. tweaks to the system, 
the unions didn't fight that nearly as hard as they fight school choice because one, well, they know that they can just move the goalposts. They've admitted as such on, on videos by accuracy and media in red states, including my home state of Texas, Tennessee, Idaho, Iowa, other red states that have banned CRT, for example, they're admitting they're still doing it on video saying, oh, well, we're not teaching CRT, we're gonna teach social emotional learning, or maybe we'll do student mental health services. They'll just move the goalposts and it's a never ending game of whack-a-mole trying to enforce these different policies. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to engage in that process. We should still try to move the needle forward in the school system, but it's still a one size fits all disaster that by definition is never going to meet the needs of varied individual families who are just quite frankly going to disagree about how they want to raise their kids. It's okay to disagree about these things. What's not okay is forcing your values on other people's children when they don't have an exit option. So school choice is the best solution from the bottom up. We're gonna continue wins in red states. Louisiana's on the cusp, yeah. Tennessee's on the cusp. Um, Idaho, where you at, that should, be, that should be coming hopefully in the next few, few years. Uh, but it'll be red states once we run out of red states, maybe some blue states will become red states by then. And at the same time, the, uh, if enough Democrats defect on the issue, the, the teacher genes won't be able to control them anymore. Or if enough people move to states with choice. Uh, yeah, right? so I mean, a lot of people ask me, how right. do I get choice in California? Move to Florida. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. well, I hadn't thought about that before. But yeah, that's, that's one way to do it. But also, if enough Democrats defected on the issue, I don't think they realize this, the unions won't be able to control them anymore. Yeah. Because the, the unions can primary one or two defectors and, and put all their money into taking them out. But if the whole Democrat caucus in a state said, to hell with this, I'm gonna side with my constituents and parents, the unions would have nowhere else to go. Yeah. They would just have to lobby for other things, maybe like the things they should be fighting for, like better pay for teachers and maybe more autonomy and stuff like that. But no, they just protect the lowest common denominator and they fight, they actually make good teachers look bad yeah. by this, this propaganda they push on Twitter all the time. Randy does it all the time. I don't know, she might even be in Ukraine. So I was gonna give her a book after this, but she might be in Ukraine right now. That's where, where she likes to go. Right. But she did so right after, I actually woke up. Okay, so a couple of years ago, I woke up. I, I wake up sometimes. I woke up to what I thought was a headline from a Babylon Bee article, but it wasn't. It was actually a tweet by Randy Weingarten herself where she said that she was in Ukraine on the front lines to assess the situation. <laughs> what the heck is the teachers union boss from America gonna do to fix things in Ukraine right now? She was running away from the nation's report card scores that just came out that found decades of learning loss after she induced school closures yeah. in the United States. I mean, having the Ukrainian kids already suffered enough? Go back home, Randy. Um, <laughs> We already destroyed our school system. You don't want to destroy, destroy all the rest of the school systems, too. But look, uh, all jokes aside, um, she should get the School Choice MVP award. She does have a dedication in the front. I posted uh, how I sent it to her in, on Twitter. Horrible handwriting. I, I Sorry again. <laughs> but uh, I think you had three questions. I think I've only answered okay, one. So, so that you correct. Uh, but that was one of the remaining two is, has Randy responded? To any any of your it's top secret information, okay. but she was supposed to go on Dr. Phil with me a couple years ago. I'm going to spill the tea on that one. Uh, she had asked uh, the team if I was going to be on the other side. They said yes. She didn't show up. So I don't think I was supposed Pretty to good. tell you guys that. But, uh, Randy Randy uh, will not debate in public. She closes her replies on Twitter just like she closed the schools because she doesn't want any form of accountability in the public sphere and doesn't want to have her ideas scrutinized in public debate. So. Um, if there is a response, I'll probably share it on social media, but we'll see how that goes. She'll never debate anybody in, in, in yeah. public. So I think Jay Green did do a, a little he thing did. on her a couple he did. with, with, the, with the, a virtual kind of conversation. So that was great. But since then, I don't think there's been any Not kind of opposition that. discussion. So everybody go check out Heritage Foundation's Jay Green. Yes. Uh, also, buy the book, The it Parent works. Revolution. You can send one to Randy Weingarten. Yeah. I mean, you're already getting books at the event today, but you can also, you live in D.C., you're probably. in the area. You can go hand deliver it to, <laughs> to the American Federation of Teachers. The NEA has offices too. They have lots of members, 3 million members. <laughs> Get them a copy. Make it a bestseller. And like Randy Weingarten said, or uh, Ted Cruz said on the back, you can ruin Randy Weingarten's day by reading this book. Yes. Last question. Yeah. Uh, 
speaking of parents, you're about to be a dad. That's right. Breaking news. Uh, yes. So we're winning so much, I'm almost getting tired of winning on school choice. choice. But this was the biggest victory of the past few years by far of my entire life. Getting married to Miranda has been a fantastic endeavor. And then not an endeavor, but a a great time. And then also it was an endeavor we had to... We had to make the child too, so that was, and then so now we have baby Angelina on the way in a, in a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of months, and, uh, and I, I'm joining guess, the parent revolution yeah. on the front lines with you. And, and, and that was my question. So, how has this changed how you think about your day to day work? I mean, it's got to be infinitely more personal. Well, it is more personal. So, you know, on the one hand, you could say that that puts a fire in your belly to fight even harder. This is this is personal now. It's over. It's about your own kid. Uh, having better opportunities. Uh, but it also, um, it makes the threats more personal too. So I had someone posting our address on Twitter. Uh, they didn't take it down. Not for, I, if that's not doxing, I don't know what is. But they were sharing our address. They, they complained about my wife and I uh, going on our honeymoon. Uh, believe it or not, people go on honeymoons. Yeah. And um, they're like, how dare you work while you're on your honeymoon? It, we, we put, it was a picture from like months thing. before. How dare you work on your it, I mean, <laughs> we were in Italy at the Coliseum. It was great, by the way. Um, went to Amalfi Coast. Highly recommend it. But um, yeah, so like, it's not like when it when it was, it was just me to worry about. There wasn't as much to worry about. It's just me. Yeah. But when it's my family, people I love, yeah. um, I do take it more personally. I'm not going to back down. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we we are watching ourselves more closely and making sure that. Uh, the family's safe and secure. Yeah, yeah. Well, with that, and congratulations again, but we'd love to open it up to any audience questions. We also have a good online viewership, um, so we'll be taking online questions as well, I think, if we have any, but we'll start in person. And uh, Yes, sir, in the front middle here, and we'll, if you'll wait on the mic. Hi. Uh, I fear here in D.C. parents are not doing too well by their children. In nearby Baltimore, I believe, something like 0% of schools got reading proficiency for their kids. So the parents are not all right. Do you see school choice helping rescue some of the lost parents? Yeah, I will say, first of all, I don't blame the parents primarily. In Baltimore, they don't have school choice, right? So you have have 40% of Baltimore high schools with 0% proficiency rates in math, dozens of schools with not a single child that is proficient in math. Um, I blame the the one-size-fits-all monopoly. Those families should have a choice to take their kids somewhere else, and the unions fight tooth and nail against it. They stand in the schoolhouse door against allowing families to have opportunities because they want to keep their monopoly. But school choice could help, uh, to get to the point of your question, with improving uh, parental involvement. It does by definition. You've got to research schools for your kid, just engaging that process. For a long time, I think because we have a school system that you're assigned to, parents have kind of washed their hands with it and said, you're going to take care of my kids. And they kind of uh, relegate those, uh, that responsibility to the government. I think that's one of the unintended consequences, or maybe intended if you look back at some of uh, the, the founders of public education. Um, but, but families uh, can become more involved. And there's actually been a study on this. It's been a, a while since I read it, but it's by Cornell researchers. Um, in 2018, they published a study finding that as school choice has expanded, online search activity, which is not, not a perfect proxy for parental involvement, but the search activity for different schooling options exploded in those areas, which just gives some evidence to the idea that once you have choice, well, then you have an incentive to actually become involved. I mean, for a lot of parents that they don't have the means to choose something else, it might just be uh, depressing to think about all these other opportunities that are so much better that they just can't access. And so um, by giving them that power, they'll feel better about the relationship with their child and their kid's education, and they'll start to seek out more options. So it's, it's not a silver bullet, but it does move the needle towards incentivizing parents to have a more active role with their child. And, and it's also the case, too, that as more and more parents choose in a universal market, you'll have more good options available across the board. The bad options are going to fall out of the market. So it almost uh, is preventative of making bad, bad, so-called bad choices in a way as well. Um, there was a great study that came out a few years ago, maybe it was 08 or so, from Patrick Wolf down at the University of Arkansas. He looked at the DC voucher program 
and found that his quote was parents move from the margins to the centers of their child's educational experience when they have choice options. I mean, the leftist media ran headlines on that DC experiment. It was a random assignment study. Yeah. It was causal. Uh, it was random chance whether you got the scholarship or not. So it was just like a medical trial. And they found that for a third of the cost, they were spending about $10,000 per scholarship. The government schools in DC spend more than $30,000 per year, about three times as much as the scholarship amount. And those families, uh, on average, they accessed schools for their kids that got about the same test scores. And then they ran with the headline there and they said, oh, it's the same test scores. And so it's a failure. It failed to produce better outcomes. But what they failed to report in that leftist media was the families reported higher levels of satisfaction and safety. Mm -hmm. And so that's a much more uh, holistic measure of success. School quality is multidimensional. Parents want their kids, especially when they're at the, in the worst school districts, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They want their kids to be in a safe place. What good are your test scores if your kid's getting beat up and bullied every day and pushed to the brink of suicide. Uh, so there's a lot of important things that go into that decision-making process, which Lindsay and Jason did a study on this out of Florida, asking parents, why did you choose this school in the school choice program? And you guys found that the top issues were having the, a values-based education that was aligned with your own. We shouldn't be surprised about COVID. Yeah. I mean, you guys were looking into this in, I think, 2018, 2017, that study yeah, was. Yeah. And uh, they wanted a safe environment yes. for their kids and test scores were at the bottom. Although academics were in the middle, it was an important part. But test scores, parents were seeing that as a disconnect between actual learning. Um, they don't want the schools teaching to the test. Not to mention in DC, they found a 20 percentage point increase in graduation rates. And they still- too. Um, other questions over here? Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Thank you very much for your work. Um, I'm curious, and uh, forgive me, I came in just a little late, so if this got mentioned at the beginning, but um, in dealing with the red states, I don't think this might be a problem, but if you get into purple and blue zones, uh, the desire to have the money go directly to the school as opposed to follow the parents, have you had to sort of, you know, deal with that and slap that away? Is that a concern? Because you do hear in some education policy circles, well, if they're going to do this, then now we're going to set up standards for all those private schools. Uh, through the state and basically republicize them. Have you had to deal with that? And what's your experience with that issue? Yeah, I mean, look at Arizona with Katie Hobbs, the, the hypocrite who went to Catholic school herself and then fights tooth and nail against school choice for others. There's an interesting story out of Arizona that the union-backed groups tried to put school choice on the ballot out there. They failed. They needed like 120,000 signatures. They said they had more than that. Uh, I think they lied. They wanted to de delay the implementation of the program in order to get past count day so they can get that money for the kid. And also they wanted it to be past the start of the school year so that parents would be less likely to switch to private schools later on. I think they were being insidious in what they were doing. So they were either lying and that makes them bad people, or if we want to be gratuitous to them, they were just not very smart. They couldn't count. They were doing common core math uh, because they said they only, they only turned in like 80,000 signatures. They said they had almost twice as much. So they were way off. I think they were lying or they were really bad at counting. Um, but Katie Hobbs has called to regulate the program after she tried to, she wanted to do a death by a thousand cuts as opposed to just getting rid of it uh, whole hog. And look, the Republicans are locked arms on this. They're not, they're not budging and they're not gonna cave to Katie Hobbs' demands because this is really popular with parents. And the, the story that unfolded in Arizona was they now have about 80,000 families benefiting from school choice in, with education savings accounts. And they showed up at those school, those signature gathering uh, locations and argued with the unions and informed voters that this actually is a benefit and it's a rising tide that lifts all boats and their fear mongering hasn't come out to play, hasn't, ha hasn't actually unfolded uh, in the state of Arizona or in any other state to be real. But to get more direct to your question about uh, with government shekels comes gov government shackles. You can have the shackles without the shekels. There are some places like, Lindsay, I'm glad you started with the Oregon example. They outlawed private education Went even school, before, yeah. um, they didn't even have any private school choice. Thankfully, that was turned down in Pierce with the child is not the mere creature of the state. Some people would be wise to listen to those words today. Joe Biden, I'm talking to you. Your kids don't belong to society. It's the parents that should decide what's best for their kids. But 
we shouldn't make perfect the enemy of the good. Not all school choice bills are created equal, I'll say that. Uh, in our model legislation, in the statute, in places like Arizona, they have anti-government regulation uh, stipulations in the statute. They say if you take the money, you can't be forced to teach CRT or gender ideology. No school choice program has ever done that, in fact. And um, because the government can already regulate private and home education without school choice, we got to take the W. Politics is all about organized interest. When more people benefit from school choice initiatives with the funding following the child, and by the way, this is all voluntary. No school choice program has ever forced the family to take the money. They can make that cost benefit decision for their own families. And by the way, Randy Weingarten, who we've mentioned too many times today, she's made the same argument that it'll regulate private schools. Do you think she's saying that because she's an anti-government libertarian? <laughs> She's saying that because she wants to keep her gravy train going, and she's a big government socialist. She just wants to keep your kids trapped in those schools that are completely run by the government and not give you any choice at all about whether to take that money somewhere else. If you go look over at, here once, uh, so we can get a few more. Yep. In states like New York, they have, they have tons of regulations of private schools and homeschooling, but no school choice. So um, in Ohio, they, they want universal on school choice, but also deregulated yeah, homeschooling right. at the same time. Yeah, New York has funding streams that go to the schools. It's not school choice. It, yep. I mean, it, yep. anyway, um, thank you, Corey, for the book, and congratulations on, on it, and I look forward to reading it cover to cover. Um, Sponsor one for your union members today. <laughs> so <clears throat> just to pick up on a point you made earlier about Arizona, so there's, at what number do you think, and it would depend on the states, off, you know, because proportionately, but what number... <clears throat> Does school choice get to a, a much stronger political position? And I bring that up. So Arizona, it's hard to roll that back, right? Because there's 80, you mentioned yep. 80,000. But in Illinois, had nine you know, it had 9,000. Yep. And they did, it, it expired. And, and that was that, like okay. shrug and move on, you know, from the political class. And so I'm wondering, um, and I, I remember when New York got its charter school law, the thing we, we wanted most of all was it, that it would outlast the governor who got it done. Right. And it has, and we were racing to put them in neighborhoods to cover enough members to get kind of that parent constituency that would, would never over be more powerful than the teacher unions, but it would keep it sustained politically. Yeah, so the Chicago Teacher Union boss to start is a total hypocrite. Her name is Stacy Davis Gates, and she was found out to send her kid to private school this year, which I don't blame her. Everybody should have those opportunities. But just a year before, she called school choice racist, and she called private school segregation academies. School choice for me, but not for thee. They know the failure factories that they're forcing other people's children into that they run with their union. Aren't good, it's not good enough for their kids, but supposedly it's good enough for everybody else's kids. But yes, they had about 9,000 kids in Illinois. They still nixed the program. J.B. Pritzker said he was going to support it. He even said if a bill came to his desk, he would sign it to save it. He probably knew the bill was never going to get to his desk. But this is why universal is so important. There's no magic number of how many is, is, is enough. You want more the merrier to be able to organize to fight back against these politicians and hold them accountable. But also, that program was targeted to low-income families. And so I think that's still a step in the right direction. Take the win when you can, even if it's an incremental reform, even if it's just for low-income families. But these families tend to be, on average, less politically mobile. And so when you have school choice, you get a larger swath of populations that have politically active parents as well. I think everybody should be able to access these programs. And then they'll be more likely to hold politicians accountable at the ballot box. In Florida, you mentioned you know, we mentioned Arizona, but Florida, they now have like 400,000 kids using scholarships according to the latest data. But in 2018, not a lot of people know this. Any DeSantis fans in the room? Nobody's from Florida. But there's, I, for people on the virtual, there were a lot of hands raised. A lot of people like DeSantis. So in 2018, you wouldn't know this because in 2022, he won his uh, reelection by like 20 points. I mean, he even won, won Miami, uh, uh, DeSantis did. And in 2018, there was a headline in the Wall Street Journal called School Choice Moms Tipped the Governor's Race for DeSantis. According to CNN exit polling, he overperformed with black moms in particular who were disproportionately benefiting from the private school choice program. His opponent, Andrew Gillum, called to get rid of the program. And so parents basically can turn into single issue voters 
on the issue of school choice. Those moms probably mm -hmm. might have might have disagreed with DeSantis on everything else. A lot of them, but on this one issue that was so important, they want their kid to get a better opportunity than they had when they were children, and so they didn't want to lose their scholarships and voted for DeSantis. So this could be a political winner for Republicans in particular. Democrats should support the kids' union and not the teachers' union if they're wise as well because the, the, the parents are more powerful in numbers and, and, and their tenacity for fighting for their kids. And so those are just a couple of examples. But yeah, they weren't able to undo it in Florida. In Florida, they even had 11% of their House Democrats vote for universal school choice last year. That's not, you know, that's, hey, I wish it was 80%, 90%. It should be 100%. But 11% is better not than bad. 0%. I'll take any one we yeah. can get. Let me, let me get a few others. And, you know, also formula fund the program. But yes, ma'am, and the purple. I thank you so much. Um, yes. Just wanted to, I really enjoyed your other book, your previous book about school choice myths, and I'm wondering if you'll respond to another one that has come out since this explosion of school choice um, at the state level, and one particularly related to Florida. I used to work in Florida politics, so this is of particular interest to me. And it's this idea that these school choice vouchers are primarily benefiting wealthy families who are already enrolled in school choice programs. And I think the numbers I saw was something about 69% of these vouchers were going to folks who are already enrolled in, in private school and only 13% were folks who were leaving the public school system. So I wonder if you'll respond to, to that claim made by the detractors. The quick response is, so what? No families should be forced to pay twice. All families should be able to take their kids' education dollars to the school that works best for them. So we, should, we don't discriminate access to public schools based on income. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't discriminate school choice programs on the, and, and restrict access on the basis of income either. But if you look at data in places like D.C., 95% of the kids are black or Hispanic. The average household income of students using the vouchers in D.C. By the way, there's thousands of families on the wait list each year trying to get those scholarships, even though they spend a third of what they're getting in the government-run school system. If it was all about money, no one would be trying to fight for these scholarships. But uh, the average household income was about $28,000 per year for the whole household in D.C., a higher cost of living area. And so in Florida, before they went universal, the average household income was also about $30,000 a year, uh, looking back at data from around 2018. So. Um, you know, the quick response is don't play it. Don't don't get on the left's playing field. They want you to bicker about who's using the program. The reality is everybody can benefit. High income, low income. I would argue the lowest income benefit the most because they are in wor the worst objectively failing government schools. But look, if if it's the case that you know some of them are high income families benefiting too, the left should. <laughs> If they're smart, they wouldn't make this argument because you're telling politically advantaged families that they benefit too. Yeah. Keep, talk, keep running that. Keep running those headlines. Oh, look, everybody can benefit. The higher income families who, who, who hold politicians accountable and who donate to campaigns, you can benefit too. They're, they're advertising for us. This is great. Um, but again, look, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I've, I've basically responded to it, which is, one, who cares? Nobody should have to pay twice. But two, it is the least advantage that benefit the most. And there are some, there's some data from, from programs suggesting that low-income families are disproportionately using. I, I think I just heard Mike Petrilli yelling all the way from downtown. Ah. Um, we've got time for one more quick one. Yes, sir, I'll go over here. Sorry. So I'm curious to ask you, um, so education is free. I can get that. But why is school buses free? Like, why are school books free? I'm going to give examples. So in college, we got to pay tuition fees separately. We got to pay for our books separately. We got to pay for other miscellaneous yep. things separately. Why is it that, you know, and also what, what's your perspective on uh, teachers' pension fund as well? Yeah, so in Illinois, since we're on the subject, um, that for the first time in 2019, their pension obligations spending has, has outweighed, it's the majority of spending even more so than K to all other K to 12 education expenses combined, they're spending more on unfunded pension liabilities than they are on the actual kids in the schools. It's, it's a total clown show in Illinois. But as far as bundling goods, the argument you'll hear from the left is that this is a, these are economies of scale. We have to have these big factory model schools, and if we bundle the goods together, it'll be cheaper somehow that way. Uh, look at the track record; it actually doesn't actually pan out that way because they just keep asking for more money over and over again. 
Uh, but look, um, and they're moving in this direction even more where they're fighting for the community schools. Mm -hmm. They yeah. want the government to control your kid from yeah. child, from, from, grave to, from cradle to grave. And um, I don't know how to fight back against that. And, let, and, and, and I think the best solution to decouple um, education expenses from, what, what, from the services would be to have education savings accounts. I think there's like 20 states with education savings accounts now, or less, but uh, a lot of states have ESAs now. It's like the voucher idea where you can take the money to a private school, but it's literally goes to a savings account that's directed by the parent, and you can use it for multiple uses. Vouch uh, vouchers were kind of the, the school choice. We've moved, moved towards ed education choice, and Milton Friedman actually talked about this in terms of multi-use vouchers. We call them ESAs now, Personal and in vouchers. Arizona, they're already doing it. You, you can use your voucher for, to pay for micro-schooling. You can use it for homeschooling curriculum, special needs educational therapies, textbooks. It's the gold standard of education freedom of the money following the child. And it's great to see. I mean, so much that I talked about this in the book, too, that the NEA, the largest teachers union, uh, which is pretty close to the White House, not too far from here, they put out an opposition research sheet on, a pre on Prenda Microschools in Arizona because they're having so much success. Uh, the, the Wall Street Journal wrote an editorial on it and had a, a funny cartoon picture of an elephant that was afraid of, of this, this tiny ant or something. It was just goes to show you that the shift in education freedom is such a threat to the unions that they're doing political opposition research on the founder, Kelly Smith of Prenda, and they know that the jig is up. That's why they're, they're losing it on social media every day. They freak out in the mainstream media. They close their replies on, on all of their tweets. They can't, they're just ripping their hair out right now with anxiety because they're no longer going to be able to force your kids in their failing unionized indoctrination centers that we call schools. So one last uh, quick thing on that. With K-12 and higher ed, since K-12 is compulsory, there is an argument that you shouldn't force the kid to pay for the textbook, right? Because they're compelled to, to go. You're not compelled to go to higher ed, so it makes sense to be out of pocket. But decoupling, yeah, like Corey says with ESAs, I think decoupling is, is a yeah, good answer. Yeah, you don't, answer have to, you don't even go, have to give us so. the 20K. Give us 15K. Yeah. We'll save taxpayer yeah. money along the way, and that's typically how it works. It's yeah. a fraction of what would, is, would have been spent in the public schools. Oh, this is saving water. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to follow up on that one. So, but thank you for the questions. Great conversation, everybody. I'm sorry we're over time, so we're going to have to wrap it there. But please join me in giving a round of applause to Corey Dean. <laughs>